Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Our guest host this week is Dr. Erica Schwartz. For more than 20 years, Dr. Erica has been at the forefront of advanced patient care, taking the best of conventional and integrative medicine and applying them to prevent disease. Dr. Erica is a distinguished AFIRM faculty member in disciplines ranging from hormone therapy, peptide therapy, and IV nutritional support. We are so pleased to be interviewing Dr. Alessio Fasano. He is a world-renowned pediatric gastroenterologist from Mass General, and he is the author of Gluten Freedom, a book for the general public about celiac disease, gluten-related disorders, and the gluten-free diet. He co-authored Gut Feelings, the Microbiome and Our Health, published in March 2021. Welcome, Dr. Fasano. Thank you, Erica. So we're here at A4M's Spring Annual Congress, it's the 30th Congress in Florida, and you speak about gut feelings, the microbiome, and our health. Can you please give our audience some insight into what your lecture is about? Yeah, I mean, um, we are at a crossroad about the science and the microbiome. We were unaware of this parallel civilization that we co-evolved with until the recent past. Technology and know-how allowed us to understand now the complexity of this ecosystem and what can do this for our, our health and how, based on our lifestyle, this you know, uh, microbiome can change and therefore change the way that we play our genetic cards. Um, so knowledge and insights on the microbiome will have a tremendous impact to establish you know, our balance between health and disease, and if we indeed develop disease, what we can do about it by manipulating the microbiome. That's interesting because can you expand on the ways in which inflammation affects our health and your take on the hygiene hypothesis and what does that mean? So inflammation when controlled is a good thing. Uh, you know, evolution speaking, we spend a lot of time to develop a mechanism to develop inflammation. Um, what we need the inflammation for. To fight was uh, the time in which was quote unquote engineered by evolution uh, was the scope, i.e. to fight infections. You know, inflammation is uh, creating a very hostile environment for microorganisms to grow. The way that was intended was that once you develop inflammation and, and these microorganisms are killed, the inflammation turns off. So, of course, you pay the price that the tissue inflamed will die, but the entire organism will survive. Um, the problem that we face right now is that, unfortunately, uh, for reasons that we didn't understand in the recent past, this inflammation um, is now not well controlled as we used to. So there are conditions that will lead to this chronic inflammatory status that on a specific genetic background leads to a clinical outcome. The hygiene hypothesis was formulated to explain exactly this phenomenon, why this is happening. And when it was formulated, it was based on the observation that only for people that embrace the Western lifestyle, the, the, the understanding of the nature of infections that were the main reason why we died and we were sick led to the implementation of remedies to fight infections. And we were being very successful in that. But at the same time, at the same latitudes where we implemented these you know, uh, remedies, we observed a surge uh, there was tip like the drop of the infections of non-infected chronic inflammatory diseases. Um, and the conclusion at that time was we've been, you know, implementing, you know, this hygiene, so we are too clean for our own goods, but we pay the price that, you know, rather than die fast of infectious disease, now we die slowly and miserably <laughs> by chronic inflammatory diseases. Correct. So at this point, the hygiene hypothesis is changing in what way? Yeah, I mean, you know, th there have been some, you know, reconsideration of the gene hypothesis. Uh, so, um, 
a again, uh, there, are, there are countries in which the hygiene has been implemented equally like in the Western Hemisphere, but they don't see this surge of chronic inflammatory diseases. We're talking about some you know, countries like in South America, like Chile uh, or Brazil um, or Southeast Asia and so on and so forth. So the, the, the hygiene hypothesis now has been revisited as the microbiome hypothesis. So in other words, anything that in the lifestyle would change the composition and particularly the function of your microbiome can lead to changes in the way that we play our genetic cards. And this is based on the fact that this co-evolving together with the microbiome implied a symbiotically friendly relationship with the microbiome. The microbiome is capable epigenetically to decide, you know, when we turn on and off some of our genes, and that dictates the shift from the genetic predisposition to clinical outcome with a specific phenotype. If you allow me a comparison, imagine the human genome made by 23,000 genes as a piano with 23,000 notes. And let's say that to play the song Breast Cancer, you have to play 300 of these notes. It depends who is the piano player. Right. If you have a microbiome that touches 200 of these 300 notes, you don't play that song. But now you change your lifestyle, you change your way of eating, you, 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 you change, in other words, the composition and function of the microbiome. A different piano player can sit at the piano and can play all 300 notes, and you, you, should, you know, start the march from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome. Right, so you're a huge advocate of diet and how the diet affects your microbiome, how it affects gene expression. So when you're talking about this, what is the diet that you go to immediately? Is it the Mediterranean diet because you come from Italy or do you believe in other ways of eating foods that will affect microbiome expression? So, bias, I am a professor of nutrition, so that's, <laughs> that's the reason why I believe the diet is the low-hanging fruit that we should all, you know, look at. Um, you know, if we accept the notion that the microbiome is so fundamental to decide the balance between health and disease, the corollary of this is that they eat whatever we eat. So, let me make another parallel, if I'm allowed. By all means. Let's, let, let's assume that the microbiome is sort of farm with different animals. And two million years ago, we decided that our farm has to have cows, horses, pigs, chicken, and so on and so forth. They need to be fed different food. But if we have, you know, a thousand, you know, chicken and uh, 10 cows, the, the proportion of food also needs to be proportional to maintain the balance of my farm. Um, if by whatever reason, I change the way that I feed my farm, and now I don't provide enough foods for chicken, what is the consequence? I will not make eggs because I will not have, you know, a thousand chicken anymore. So out of the, of the you know, um, the parallel, you know, um, for, for two million years, since we were gutter hunters, we've been, you know, eating a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables, uh, nuts, tubers, olive oil. Why? They're there, easy. You pick, they don't run. Meat, of course, but you have to catch them. And it's lean meat because these are animals that they are, you know, again, escaping their predators. So they are not beefed up with, you know, antibiotics or hormones and so on and so forth. What changed in these two million years? There have been three key revolutionary changes that impact, you know, the way that we eventually face the reality of our health right now. The first one was 10,000 years ago, the advent of agriculture. We now can predict the food up, you know, um, you know, that we can get, get yeah, available uh, because we domesticated crops and animals. And of course, there was a, a key milestones that allow us to just, just not, not jump from one tree to another like chimpanzees, but you know, build the Torre Eiffel or the Colosseum. Then the second major change was urbanization people leaving the countryside and become only consumers and not producers. And now they have to be, you know, relying on who produce the food for them. And who is left in the countryside, so in other words, you know, farmers, they need to produce not only for their own, you know, needs, but also for the community of people that they are not capable to produce food anymore by the consumers. The kiss of death is the, been the last one. 
you know, globalization in which few multinational companies took over and they produce massively the food that we consume. These changes went parallel with the decrease of quality of what we eat. And it's intuitive because, of course, it's not, you know, mild zero, it's not season, you know, driven uh, process. And if I am a, a multinational company that produces a massive amount of, uh, let's say, grain, I can't afford to lose 10% of my crops. And what I do, I use, you know, whatever, chemicals, whatever, so to, pr to preserve my production. And this, you know, comes with consequences. Am I advocating that we have to go back to the caveman lifestyle? Of course not. Uh, but, you know, um, favoring, you know, local pr pr production of, of, of you know, um, nutrients? Absolutely. Eating in season? Absolutely. Um, back to what we used to do in terms of proportion? Of course. The Mediterranean diet is one that really reflects exactly the way that we evolved. So let me give another parallel. We spent two million years to build a huge, very sophisticated Ferrari that required 95 octans gas in the tank. And now we put Coca-Cola in it. And we are wondering why the car is not running efficiently. It's obvious why not. You know, you know that we don't have the right fuel for that car. So since we can't change very much of the food industry because it's so expensive at this point, right? And we're changing the way we react to it. How do you recommend, how do you think we can adjust and manipulate the microbiome since that's really what we have access to directly, individually? I have to say that this would take, you know, so much time to go through this because this is a social, economical, and political issue. Um, you know, we have, you know, citizens of class A and class B, we have food inequities, we have, you know, issues of access to proper health and so on and so forth. But if I was in charge, if I was the politician you on the show, okay, and I would do, do purely an economic evaluation and I say, it will cost me more to fix this chronic inflammatory diseases of an aging, you know, population as a health care system um, or will cost me less if I try to intercept and mitigate the impact of these problems um, by decreasing, you know, the frequency of chronic inflammatory disease that makes the people chronically sick, not, you know, uh, active in the society to produce wealth and so on and so forth. The latter is by far the best way to go. Another parallel, what kind of car you have? Um, I have a Jeep. Do you change the oil to your Jeep? I have my husband take it out to tell you. And why he does? Because it's time to make sure you keep it clean. Fifty dollars a line change the oil is much cheaper than five thousand exactly. dollars of engine that blows up. That's right. We the healthcare now is a system in which we don't change oil. We wait that the engine blows up. It's not cost effective. Right. It's a win 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 situation. If everybody will eventually embrace this concept that prevention is cheaper than treating. Who has to make money out of it? Healthcare system will save money. The society will have a return on investment. We will live a better life. How complicated is this? It is complicated because, again, it's a shift of paradigm. There is any other way to manipulate the microbiome other than diet? Of course. Of course, but you know, again, it's the easiest, the easiest and the most natural way. But that will also imply that we need to tackle health disparities and food inequities that is the plague that we face right now. I'm a pediatrician and I've never seen pathologists in pediatrics that I see right now. The, the, the rate of, of um, you know, uh, childhood obesity and the complication that come with that is unparalleled. I've never seen kids with hypertension that I see now. Kids with cirrhosis, never seen that, and we see that now. Cardiovascular accident in pediatrics, it was a, a nonsense. Right. So we reached the point in which the life expectancy of this generation, for the first time in human history, would be lower than the life expectancy 
of our generation. Shame on us it is. as a society. And we it need is. to do something about it. So while we're trying to change the whole politics of it, um, back to the microbiome, and we're talking about prebiotics and probiotics. Do you recommend any specific I mean, ones uh, we, in there? We, we are on a stage in which we barely understand what are the problems in the balanced microbiome. Mm -hmm. So, and now we are trying to capitalize on what to do about it. So, we are not quite at the stage in which we can customize an intervention with prebiotic and probiotic to rebalance the microbiome. We will. We're going to get there. And I, you know, I believe that the future is going to be based on your genome, specific manipulation of your microbiome to decrease the risk to develop disease, uh, you know, over time. In the meantime, common sense is to use natural sources, prebiotics, you know, fermented food, probiotics, yogurts, because they have the wealth and the diversity of the strains that you need to use. Of course, there are commercially available probiotics, prebiotics, and so on and so forth, but this is short in the dark. So we are trying to do something to improve our health, but it's not customized to the specific needs that we have to rebalance our microbiome. Again, we'll get there, but no, we're not quite there yet. Back to the diet, of course. That's right. Exactly. Anything else would you like to tell us about it? No, other than, you know, again, uh, I, I was thinking, you know, while we were writing this book, Gut Feelings, that again, um, it, it's, it, it, was, uh, it was quite an exercise. I really didn't want to do this because, you know, believe it or not, the, the most active field in science ever is in the microbiome. Now we have a, a rate of 700 papers a day that come out on the microbiome. And, you know, while we were writing this book, we finished the chapter, moved the next one, the previous one was already obsolete. Right. And so I said, we're not going to get that anywhere with this. But, you know, the lesson that I learned from this exercise is really if we want to make an impactful difference on human health, we have to have the humility to understand that this is a complex situation, a multidisciplinary approach is needed. Um, mathematicians will play a major role, believe it or not, for this modeling to stratify the population for personalized intervention and again for disease interception. Um, the solo flyer will not do this. And again, uh, the humility to understand that, you know, it, it takes a village to do that is important. And, you know, I'm going to finish by saying one of the most harsh, you know, lessons that I learned is to work on the microbiome in kids with autism. It's a disgraceful situation because of all the chronic inflammatory diseases that, you know, experience an acceleration, this is the most, you know, impactful that I've seen in only 25 years. It went from one in 5,000, one in 58. We are doing something intrinsically wrong. And we have, again, the moral obligation to do something about it. We need a, a Manhattan project to take the best of the best, lock in a room, throw the key and say, you don't get out of here until we find the solution. That's what is needed. Correct. Dr. Fasano, thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thank you for having me.